There is some scientific theory to the effect that sound waves never die, and that though they may become too faint to be detected by the human ear, they continue on wandering about the world forever and ever. Electrical waves are known to girdle the earth three and four times, and there is some philosophic speculation that thoughts are floating around in the ether. They await only a mind properly attuned to be received and converted into conscious and tangible ideas. Either the scientific or the philosophic theory might serve to explain many forms of ghostly phenomena, might give us an inkling as to how the super-sensitive spirit may become aware of the clanking of chains, or the sound of stealthy footsteps, or the cry of a long dead voice in some eerie haunted spot. Have you ever had the feeling that you're being watched? You spin around quickly and your brain tells you that there's no one there, but... The hairs on the back of your neck tell you differently. To the best of my recollection, I think it was the summer of 97. Um, I was out with... Uh, with my girlfriend and we were away on Thanksgiving weekend and we were off seeing the sights but late coming back and thought we were going to be late for dinner and uh, when we came back to town and I turned the corner to pull in the laneway I saw a figure in the window and realized that great you know your sister's here or something we're not we're not gonna be in, <laughs> in trouble and when we got into the apartment uh, you know, I asked for her and there was no answer and I asked again and there was no answer and I was really confused. <laughs> Looked at my girlfriend at the time and like, I saw somebody in that window above the apartment. Uh, did she believe me? I think maybe she didn't want to believe me, but I, I'm sure I was convincing and let her know that I was serious. And I was quite, I, I think maybe confused and, and looking forward to seeing her sister to see if she was actually there. Thought maybe she was playing a trick on us. <laughs> I saw him again. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, must have been a couple months later. Uh, I was there. It was late one evening, must have been 10 p.m. or so. And my, my uh, girlfriend and I were watching a movie and she had kind of fallen asleep or dozed off on me. And out of the corner of my when I hit my eye, I saw somebody sort of peek around the corner at me. And I, I jerked and she kind of jostled and she, and she said, what's that? And I, or what's wrong? And I said, no, don't worry about it. The movie just scared me or something. I didn't want to, didn't want to uh, upset her. So she fell back asleep and I tried to stop thinking about it and watch the movie. And I don't know how much longer, but maybe 10 minutes again and maybe a little more pronounced a little further out and I jerked again and <gasps> Clark something is wrong what is it I don't know if I should tell you <laughs> I think I'm crazy. No, no, I won't think you're crazy. What is it? She woke up once more and I, I, I think I tried to fluff it off like it was nothing, but she probably saw I was, I was shaking. So I think I told her, I can't remember it. It's a long time ago now. And there was only one other, one other occasion where I felt him and that was, we had, we were just in the, the apartment ourselves and, 
and getting ready to go somewhere or just come from somewhere. And I went into the washroom and we were talking and uh, I thought she was still behind me and because her bedroom wasn't too far from us. So I continued to talk. You kind of love the movie. Doug and Jane saw it and they uh, said there's this really cool fight scene between the uh, vampire slayer and the werewolf. You're into that kind of stuff, right? Amy? Amy, I thought you were right here. <laughs> Amy? Clark, did you say something? I thought she had come back into the bathroom, or standing in the doorway anyway. I could feel her there, and I was. she didn't answer when I asked a question. And when she didn't answer every hair on my body sort of stood on end and I looked over my shoulder and she was on the other side of the apartment not even anywhere near me so it was just whoa the sensation when I was in the in the washroom that was physical for me I mean even telling the story just now or, or anytime I tell this story that that moment he was, I think, literally standing right behind me, maybe breathing down my neck. I'm getting a chill thinking about it right now. He was, uh, he was there. I knew he was there. It was an intense experience, but it wasn't super fearful. I never, I wasn't afraid for us, or I don't think she was either, but I made sure each time I came in the apartment to say hello and ask how he was doing. And if it was a good day, it was beautiful outside sort of thing to always sort of <laughs> keep myself on in his good books, if you will. Uh, when I think about how real it was, uh, I was never a, a big believer in ghosts my whole life, and I was, it didn't consume me or I didn't think much of it. But I was a believer <laughs> instantly when, when it happened. And, you know, to anyone who, who would question whether what I'm saying is real or, or is true, um, uh, I could look them in the eye with as much conviction as as this and let them know that it was real and it doesn't matter if they believe me or they don't believe me, it, it happened. Nobody's opinion is going to change that. He was eccentric in his clothing, in his interests, and in his behaviors. In life, he was a loner, often cranky and surly. But in death, his spirit befriended one person. And our next door neighbor was Johnny Bolton, an eccentric old bachelor. As we were growing up, we became, we began to, to know Johnny and knew that he was a, a stingy old man who was not fond of children, and uh, we know we harassed him, but we didn't realize how bad we were really being. And he had the apple orchard to die for. It was abundant with fruit, not only apples, but, and uh, he would not share ever. I can remember that uh, there wasn't one child or, or older person in Appleton, I don't think that ever can say they didn't climb his tree and give it a good shake while he was sleeping because he was deaf. But uh, I remember one night that he was visiting with my mother and my brother came home with a big chest full of sweater all swollen full of apples underneath. And Johnny looked at him and said, you've got quite a swelling there, lad. And my mother said, I think he has enough for an apple pie. And uh, Yes, I think he does, so. <laughs> and he had um, a three-wheeled cart, which consisted of a bicycle with a cart built onto it, which he carried his dog in and his groceries, and he would pedal into Carlton Place every Saturday, and he was known for playing his bagpipes, so he would walk up and down in front of the Queen's Hotel, and he would play his pipes off key because he was tone deaf, but he always had a following. Uh, in Appleton, he paraded up and down 
the veranda of the house from end to end, again playing Work for the Night is Coming, and Off Key, and most people used to close their doors. On Halloween, his orchard got raided by several people, and uh, his outhouse quite often got moved back a couple of feet as well. Johnny was a man that wanted to be very modern. He had built himself a garage across from his house, and in it he had a brand spanking new car. I do not know the make of it, and he never learned to drive, but he wanted to say he had a car. And he kept it polished. It just shone. And every Halloween, the car was removed from the garage and driven down the hill and parked. And in the morning, Johnny would awaken and look down and was in a great fit of anger when he saw his car had been removed. And he, he would stomp. He had skinny bowed legs and he would stomp down the hill. And you know, then he would ask someone to please bring it back up the hill. And it was usually the same person that took it down the hill that drove it back up. Uh, Johnny was very fond of my mother because she was a very, very kind lady. And um, he did come to our house quite often to visit. And she always had a treat to send back home with him. But it, when he was getting older, he said to my mother, if I give you my house, would you move into mine and take care of me? And uh, my mother said she had to think it over because she had four of us and Johnny was not used to having other people in his house. But she knew it was a much bigger house, but it still did not have hydro nor waterworks. But it had two extra bedrooms that we didn't have. And uh, so the change took over and he eventually became bedridden. So he was a real handful, but she never complained, never. She, she took very good care of him and he appreciated it. After Johnny's passing in 1946, the Command family continued to live in the house, but eventually moved on. And by the 1980s, Don and Marilyn Anderson moved in. It wasn't until I was having these um, feelings about someone being in the house with me that um, I don't know whether I asked then who had been there to begin with, but found out through the locals that um, they talked about Johnny Bolton and how he played the bagpipes at night up and down the front friend and how he went off to parades and everything and that that was when I realized that this was who was you know entertaining me or or being around with me. You feel something. Is somebody there? Could that be you Johnny? No, there was no, no seeing, no really, just feeling the presence was, was very, very strong, that, that there was somebody there. He usually came out of the cupboard, which was, as you came in the front door, the stairs went straight up, and as they did in those old-fashioned houses, and that someone had made a little cupboard just to the left of the stairs and it had a an old uh, piece of material or whatever on it. It didn't have a door. It just had the um, hanging uh, material and that would flutter and open that, you know, enough for someone to come out of it. Johnny, that's where you're coming from. Come in, let's have a visit. That was when I first realized that there was somebody about. He would come out and then the curtain would fall back down. It was fun. 
after I got used to it, you know, to look forward to it and wonder if it would happen again. Yeah, a good feeling. But it's hard when you don't see someone. You know, you're, you're sort of realizing what, what uh, is taking place. I think he enjoyed the visit. Um, but, but how am I to know? Uh, but he must have enjoyed it or wanted to, to have a little chat because I always had a chat with him. I heard you used to live in this house and that you played the bagpipes. And I think you worked in the mill. I heard the fellows in the village used to tease you. I feel that you're leaving. Did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. I hope you come back. I enjoy your visits. Maybe that was something he enjoyed. I have no idea. But being a talker. Oh yes, it was so strong. It was so real. It was, it, it was a real experience. I can't use any other word. No, I wasn't scared. And, and I felt intrigued. I felt almost honored that he thought to come, you know? Being the target of practical jokes and teasing over the years, it's no wonder that Johnny kept his distance from people. But he obviously saw something in Marilyn that made him want to befriend her. Many of the sounds and voices in the night are made by the spirits of men others by the spirits of women, and even children. But some are not human. The house started out as James Wiley, who was a contractor on the Rideau Canal, and he um, bought 200 acres here. It was a church property. And so he built a log cabin and had... Um, seven children, outgrew a log cabin, so he built this beautiful stone house on the Mississippi in around 1840. And so all the stone came off of the property, and um, it's all limestone, and all the wood came off of the property. And he had a distillery. We have a stream. The Wolf Grove Creek goes by through the property with a 50-foot waterfall that in the spring is just like gushing. Now it's pretty gentle. We have mallard ducks that nest out there and turtles, and uh, it's, it's a lovely place to sit. So the house, um, about 1912, was sold to Macintosh Bell, who was, the, who was a really famous geologist who loved being here. And in 1932, he, he upped the ante and, and built a Georgian library on. So instead of doing a deck like we do today, he build a Georgian library, <laughs> and then he hit the roof on the third floor to make the sleeping accommodation, make the ceilings higher. Well, my husband and I love to do bed and breakfast. He has children out in California, so we always did bed and breakfast. And we kept saying we were just all alone in this house because our children are all growing up, and we go. He said, you know, this would make a great bed and breakfast. And because I'd been in the Foreign Service, I was used to entertaining, and I go, well, yeah, we just have to do breakfast, that's easy. So we did it for 20 years and met all kinds of wonderful, interesting people. People just come to your doorstep. The world arrives at your doorstep, which is very cool. Well, the legend is of the ghost horse is really interesting, and it's, it's a very simple story. But I had this wonderful magazine from 1931, and I would love to read it to you because it is a, it is a, a horse that died. But he died in our sunken garden 
which is very enclosed and it was in a snowstorm so we've heard and he could not get out in the dead of winter when when the icy winds come streaking through the trees and fine snow sifts under the threshold of old burnside the hoofbeats of a phantom horse are heard outside the walls it is not the steed of norse princeling or the thunder of some mythical beast that gallops across the land in the very teeth of the storm. But it is the sound of a poor starved beast that a century or more ago took refuge in the lee of the then deserted house, found his way up a narrow lane between the buildings and a protecting wall, and unable to turn or free himself from the cul-de-sac, froze to death. The forlorn knocking of his stiffened limbs is said sometimes to re-echo there today, a drear but not too dangerous sound. It had a Swedish lady that sure, was sure that she heard the chains rattling on the horse ghost. And I've had other people that go, this is just really weird, just walking down from the third floor, there was somebody there. Just, you know, those electric currents that we talked about. <laughs> So, yes, I even had one lady that said somebody entered her room well, the night before, and I go, no, <laughs> but who knows? Who knows? You have Well, just that they were nice and friendly and warm and genuine and not mean. So they were good vibes, yeah. Some specters are ominous and threatening. Others are mischievous, but a few are nurturing and compassionate. When we moved into the house, um, not right away, but shortly thereafter, we noticed that certain things were um, different in the house. And uh, we didn't have children at that point. And the odd time, um, light fixtures would be on, uh, friends would come to visit and uh, comment on this, a strange feeling they had in the house and things of that sort. And then the two girls came along and uh, we added a part on above the garage and it was a bedroom for us. And my father, to commemorate the fact that our house was new again because it was a very, very old house. He bought us um, an old grand, it was a new clock, but an old grandfather clock and with the pendulum and everything. And uh, so my husband was an electrical engineer and we picked the certain wall to hang the clock on and um, the clock wouldn't work and we couldn't figure out what was wrong with the clock. So Mark took the clock back to the clock maker or the store that we bought it off of and they did whatever adjustments they thought were needed and uh, sent it home. And again, on the same wall, the clock would not work again. This went on three or four times. Finally, after like saying to my father, like it's not working, blah, blah. Maybe it's the ghost and my dad kind of rolling his eyes. Uh, she took it back again. And I, the clock repairman just joked, like jokingly was like, oh my gosh, would you have a ghost in the house? Cause there's nothing else I can do here. Like everything's fine. Um, Mom still has the clock, but it was just on that, when it was on that wall that it would misbehave. Cause it still works to this day. Jessie used to wake up, you know, fairly often. She wasn't the world's best sleeper. And uh, this one time, all of a sudden, I heard her yelling and I woke up. And what had happened was she had gotten up at, um, I'm not sure what time of the day it was, very, very early morning, I think. And she had come down the three steps. And as she was going down the steps, um, she saw an old woman sitting beside me. First thing I saw was right in front of me was my mom sleeping in bed on her side and there was something looked like an older woman in a gown like a almost like a nightgown from what I can think of 
she was kind of leaning over my mom sleeping and she was actually combing my mom's hair brushing my mom's hair with a brush jesse being only five years old um her first impulse was leave her alone I can't picture a face at all. She was, it looked like a white kind of almost fog to her. So she was um, transparent. I could see through her, but definitely was there. Uh, and I remember either screaming or something made the being look up and notice me. And she kind of repositioned herself, kind of got up and almost i mean it sounds kind of kitschy but like she like floated back into the studio which was right behind their bedroom and then she just kind of disappeared and i think at that point i just ran over and jumped into bed with my mom mommy mommy jesse honey what's the matter i just saw a scary lady oh. It was more of a startled feeling as opposed to being scared. It was just startling for a little girl. Um, but it was definitely a, it was definitely quite the unique experience. I feel privileged to have been able to experience that. Um, and from what I've heard, the new owners have seen an older woman in the house. Um, so it kind of, Makes you think, yeah, that did, <laughs> that did happen. Because at some points you think you're the only one, right? But no, it was a really neat feeling. I do feel very, very uh, lucky to have experienced that. Verification. <laughs> That's what I thought. I mean, finally, finally someone saw what you intuitively felt. And uh, it was wonderful. I, I, I just, I remember feeling so flattered that the woman would sit beside my bed and in a, I lost my mom when I was young. And um, the thought of an older woman sitting beside me and just stroking my hair in a very loving way, I just thought it was beautiful, which is, I think, what I tried to get across to Jessie, that it wasn't anything to be afraid of. It was... It was beautiful. As far as I know, that was the only time she saw anything. Um, then we had other bizarre incidents happen in the house. Um, Jessie, the same year, had come home and it was Christmas time and she had made a little angel. It only would have been about that big. And I still see it. It had a little face and it had a little halo over top and then it had like a little tent white dress. Oh, and the little wings. And uh, so being a very proud mother, I, you know, put it up on the fridge. And, and then thereafter, for honestly a couple of years, um, that angel would be turned over. So if you left the kitchen and you went into the other room, when you came back in, the angel would be turned over. And none of us, and my father was there a lot, and... None of us could ever figure out. Mark was in a wheelchair by that point. So it wasn't like he could automatically, you know, zip into the kitchen and turn the ghost over. And um, everyone said they hadn't done it. And when we finally did sell the house, I got the, bi the Bible out and made everyone swear on it. And uh, not one of us had ever done that. My husband had multiple sclerosis and he was getting very, very bad um, in 1993. So we had to put the house on the market and I, I loved this house. I, um, it wasn't like a house to me. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I just, I loved the house. And I was having, I mean, I wasn't having a hard time in the sense that we had to move because obviously we had to, um, but I was having a hard time in leaving my house and um, the house didn't sell right away. And 
When it finally did sell, I went back for the final clean, even though nobody had been there for about three months. And um, But we had cluster flies and stuff. So I wanted to make sure that everything was pristine. But more than that, it was completely selfish reasons. I wanted to go back to my house by myself. So, um, so I drove up and it was on a country road. So neighbors weren't close. But if you left your car outside, they would know that you were there and then they would probably come in to say hi. And I didn't want anyone coming in to say hi. I just wanted to be alone with my house. I, mean, <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I wanted to be alone. So, um, so I actually parked the car in the garage, which had two metal doors, um, you know, one on this side, one on this side. Um, and then I went into the house and the house between the kitchen and the garage was a steel door as well as the other two. So I went into the house and um, I just sat down and I had never actually spoken before. And I just sat down and I started to cry. <laughs> I know you're here. This will be my last time ever in this house. Could you please just give me a sign? Please just let me know. So I sat there and, and the earth didn't open, nothing happened. and. Uh, so after about 20 minutes, uh, you know, I got over my cry and I went about and vacuumed up the cluster flies and I came downstairs and right where the kitchen door was, the steel door I told you about, um, right adjacent to that was a little bathroom. Damn. The neighbors are here. And I went fully expecting to see one of my neighbors and there was no one. The door was just open. And then I remember, I just sat down, I just sat down and I started to cry again. And I just said, thank you. And uh, yeah, it was really, it, it was very hard leaving that house. It was, uh, I always felt very protected there. I, you know, my husband was getting very bad and the girls were little and, I just had a beautiful, protective feeling in that house. And she got all her stuff together and left. But it really, I think, was closure for my mom. It made her feel, it made her feel very good. And it just closed that chapter, I think, for her. She was really happy with that sign. He was the younger brother in the third generation of a rich and successful family. He was free to pursue his dreams of stardom on the stages of Broadway until his brother was killed in the Great War. He had to abandon his place in the limelight to manage the family business. In life, he was charming and generous by nature, with a pronounced streak of mischievousness thrown in but he was also depressed and unfulfilled. Many decades later, his spirit still wanders his beautiful home, playing tricks while no doubt waiting for a casting call from Broadway. Good morning. I'm Spirita Mediumo. Nice to meet you. I'm Andrea. I'm the medium. I've made arrangements with the curator to use the president's office. I'm attempting to reach the ghost of Archibald Rosamond. Michael told me to expect you. Unfortunately, he can't be here today, but asked me to give you all the help that you need. We're really very excited about this. Do you think it'll really work? Nothing's 100%, but... I've got a good feeling about this one. I can't wait. Can I sit in? It would be fantastic to see him. Better not. Well, at least not at first. It might scare him away. But maybe once we get going, 
if I think it's not going to spook him, I'll invite you in, okay? Yes, yes, please. <laughs> please make it go well, please. I explained to Michael that I need a personal possession of Archie, something that he would have actually touched and used. Were you able to find something? We sure did. We have his personal makeup case that he used when he was on stage on Broadway. It's in the office waiting for you. That's wonderful. May I go in now? Absolutely. I've pulled all the blinds like you've asked. Can I get you anything? Water? Coffee? Tea? No, I'm fine. Thanks. Okay, go ahead and just holler if you need anything. Thanks. I will. <laughs> Archie's makeup case. Archie Rosamond, please join me. Archibald Greenfield Rosamond, please join me. You are Archie Rosamond. Of course I am. Who are you? Did we have an appointment? My name is Perita Mediumo. I'm a writer and I am writing a book on your life story. I don't remember anything about this. I wasn't even planning on coming into the office today. A book, eh? That's right. The story of your life. Hey, I like it. How do we do this? It's easy. I just ask you a few questions and we basically have a chat. Is that okay? Sure, fire away. Wonderful. Let's start at the beginning. That's easy. I was born and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's succinct. Anything happened in between? A few things. Let's talk about them. So, you were born here in Elmont, right? That's right, in 1875. And the Rosamonds built several mills here and were by far the major employer in town. And you and your brother Alex were the third generation owners? Yes, uh, he took over the business after Uncle Bennett. Alex had a good head for business and he really seemed to enjoy it. And did you have a role in the mill? No, I had other plans. I was an actor and a rather good one if I do say so myself. Did you know that I had played on Broadway? Yes, I had heard that. Very impressive. Well, thank you. I could have made it really big, you know. I could have been the next Adolphe Manjou. He was my favorite actor. But you didn't have the chance. No, my brother Alex, bless his soul, decided to enlist in the army. He didn't have to. He was well over the age of conscription. But Alex was quite a man. He was killed at the Battle of the Somme. How tragic. Yes. He was very heroic, actually. That's him, and a very good likeness it is, sitting on the statue in the center taff in town. It was sculpted by our good friend, Kate McKenzie. Yes, I've seen it. Very impressive. Your brother's death changed your life, didn't it? It certainly did. I had to give up my career on Broadway and come back here to run the business. How did you feel about that? Truthfully, I hate it. I believe everyone has a destiny, and mine is on the stage. I love acting. It's the only time I feel really, really alive. I understand what you mean. You ran the Rosamond Woolen Company for 28 years. And counting. Sometimes it seems 10 times that long. Some say that the company failed under your leadership. Nonsense. 
Sure, there have been some bumpy patches, but we're here, aren't we? We are indeed. I've heard that there were times when you paid many of the workers' salaries out of your own pocket rather than laying them off. Is that true? Yes, it is. But I believe that if you show loyalty to people, they'll return the favor. And they have. I'm sorry, but I have to ask you this. Some people say that the reason the company failed was, um, uh, how can I put this? Because you and the bottle had an overly intimate relationship. Is that so? They say that, do they? And just who is they? Never mind, don't answer. I know who. So what if I have a drink or two every once in a while? Anybody who doesn't do so is just not normal. Let's move on to other topics or this interview is over. Absolutely. Uh, tell me about that beautiful house of yours. <sighs> yeah, that's better. Hmm. Yes, it, it really is beautiful. It's one of the few perks I've been able to enjoy since leaving the theater. That and my automobile. I've more than doubled the size of the house since I moved in. And I love the property too. When I'm home, I feel like an English lord. I can see why. That's a big house for one person. Did you live there alone? I did for a while after my wife moved out. But for some time, I have been allowing other families to move in. Not all together, of course, just one at a time. You didn't mind that? Well, no, they're really nice people, actually. And it's kind of nice to have somebody around to play jokes on. Yes, I've heard you enjoyed practical jokes. What sort of things did you do? All kinds of things. I move things around in the middle of the night while they're sleeping. I hide things. Once, I even rolled a wooden ball down the stairs while they were dining. One of my favorites is the servant's bell. I do it every now and again. It can be activated from any room in the house. There are several dials, one for each room. So for example, if I'm in the master bedroom and want to summon help, I just pull a cord, the bell rings, and the dial for that room spins. It shows the staff where I am. Sometimes, when the staff is off duty, I'll have some fun with the family by making all the dials spin at the same time. They get so astonished and they say things like, oh, it must be a ghost. It's so funny. <laughs> That does sound like fun, very Downton Abbey. But you must have been really fast to get from one room to another to make them all spin at the same time. Well, I've, I've never really thought about it. I just seem to be able to do it. That's interesting. Any other jokes stand out in your mind? Hmm, let me see. Yes. It was Christmas time. I don't seem to remember what year. Hmm. Oh, that doesn't matter. The family was having this big shindig. Well, it was a cold, typical early December evening uh, for a Christmas party being put on for and by the um, Almonton District Arts Council. And uh, we all went over and it was great. And uh, a lot of people milling around, having a good time. Attendance was good at these parties because uh, uh, they were a lot of fun with everybody involved. It's an old building. I do remember being out uh, in the foyer area, not the main living room, leaning up uh, on the <clears throat> mantelpiece with my glass of wine, uh, like most people were having, and uh, the fireplace was ablaze, and the large Christmas tree was standing out uh, across from the fireplace, the far corner of the uh, main entrance. And um, the doorbell rang. I said, I'll get it, no problem. So I went to the front door. First thing I saw, of course, was, oh, it's snowing out. It's fantastic. This is great. Pre-Christmas, December evening. Couldn't have a better thing on a Christmas party evening. And, uh, and I thought I'd smelled snow when I stepped outside. Some people can. Anyway, um, I answered the front door, nobody there. Is there a back door? Where should I go? There's no one there. It's just, oh, try the back. People park at the back sometimes. Oh, straight through the kitchen. I went, uh, answered the door, opened the back door. Nobody there. That's strange. 
Um, is there any other access where the doorbell would ring from? She says, no, it's just those two doors, the back and the front. I said, well, there's nobody there. And it's snowing and there's no footprints in the snow and there's no tire tracks at either entrance. And she said, without breaking her stride or conversation, oh, it's just Archie up to mischief. I knew who Archie was at that point. Um, one of the spirits in the house, or the spirit in the house, who apparently lived in the attic. Well, that makes sense. That's usually where ghosts would hang around, I guess, up in the attic. At least that's what we're told. Um, so it was just taken in stride that this was Archie playing tricks on us, um, or wanting to join the party. Um, because when there's no footprints in the snow, that's pretty telling. Uh, unless, of course, somebody had the ability to float around outside and ring the bell. So uh, we carried on with our wine in the fireplace, enjoying that and people around. There were a lot of people out in the foyer because the party had a lot of people there and the chairs were all taken and uh, there was a lot of space out in the foyer too and it was nice by the fire anyway. Um, at one point too, uh, all of a sudden... A Christmas ornament just came tumbling from the top of the tree, like on a Dr. Seuss cartoon program for Christmas, The Grinch. Uh, an ornament came down, hit one branch, another branch, another branch, crash on the floor. And we all looked at each other and laughed again, uh, because we didn't see any reason why that would have fallen down off the tree. So we took it, again, we just took that in stride and had a wonderful chuckle over that. At the end of the party, um, a number of people had left and I was sitting in the living room chatting with other people uh, as well. Uh, and then we eventually all got up to leave and I noticed under the tree three or four or five other, other ornaments on the floor. None of them broken, but there they were on the floor. Nobody had heard anything. I mean, there are too many people around to, I guess, keep an eye on the tree, but ornaments don't just fall off trees uh, by themselves. So I guess we went home wandering in a, uh, how would you say it, a, a strange but jovial way about Archie entertaining us at the Christmas party. <laughs> I like that. That's very humorous. I can see why you enjoyed that. There's something else I have to ask you. What year is it? What year is it? Why in the world would you ask me that? I'm just curious to hear your answer. So tell me, what year is it? Oh, I get it. This is a game or a joke, like a knock-knock joke. No, not a game, not a joke. Just humor me. What year is it? Okay, I'll play along. It's 1944, of course. Now, hit me with a punchline. As we say in showbiz, timing is everything. I suspect you're going to be surprised to hear this. It's 2015. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I don't get it. What don't you get? I don't understand the joke. It's a picture of your tombstone. Look at the names and dates. My tombstone? No, no, that's impossible. I'm sitting right here. Is this your idea of a joke? I'm sorry, it's not a joke. But look how they remember you. Many lives were made happier because he lived. And here's your death notice in the newspaper. It, it can't be. Well, it looks real. Wait a minute. You had this printed. It's a fake. It's real. Haven't you noticed how I'm dressed? Oh, and look at this. It's called a smartphone. Things like this didn't exist in 1944. In fact, they wouldn't be around for another 60 years. What, what does this mean? Are you trying to tell me I'm dead? I'm not dead. Then I would be a ghost. I'm no ghost. 
I can prove it to you. Put your hand over the photograph that I put on your desk and then look down. It can't be. I am a ghost. No. 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 I was right. He was one of the ones that didn't know he'll He'll probably never come back again. He died young, and he died swiftly. His dreams and aspirations unfulfilled. Could that be why his restless spirit remained behind? My mother had told us that she had seen the ghost many times. She had been working at the kitchen counter and there's a window that looks out into the driveway. She had seen something at the window and then realized it was uh, um, just ahead and never really mentioned anything to anyone because she thought that it had been someone from outside looking in. And after seeing that about three or four times, she mentioned it to the, the family at dinner one night and then we started keeping track, watching for footprints. We never found any, even in winter. And uh, so yeah, she was the first person to ever hear or, or see this ghost. My mom had been lot sleeping one night and kind of rolled over and looked over to the bay window. Harry, why are you looking out the window? You are real, and you're in the house. Gary, Gary, wake up, wake up. What? I just saw something. I thought it was you. He was wearing your bathrobe. The reason she thought it was my father was he was wearing, it was a man, and he was wearing um, a plaid, dark plaid dressing gown. And later on, we found out it really wasn't a dressing gown. It was more of um, a British, from England, uh, waistcoat or a, a petticoat kind of thing that the gentleman would wear, you know, centuries ago. And that's, that's what she had thought was a, was a dressing gown. And my father had one, so she assumed it was him because the brain goes to what's most logical. Yeah. I was with my mother when we, we were both sitting in the den, which was our TV room at the front of the house. And it has two windows that overlook the walkway into the house and my sister and her friend from across the street were skipping. So we could see them out the window. And we heard this voice call my mom's name. Friend. It must be Joan. Odd she'd drop by this late. Both of us heard it. We looked at each other and said, oh, it, it must be the neighbor because she often comes in the back door and will call for my mom uh, because it's quite a long house from the back to the front. And so being the younger, my mom said, we'll go see what she wants. Fran. The, the voice now was definitely male and it said again, her name, but in a more urgent kind of calling way, like, where are you? I called you. And we looked at each other. And then, of course, now I had to go and investigate. I went into the kitchen. The door to the backyard was locked. Uh, we had a door to the basement as well. And there's, there's five separate rooms in the basement. But after the first room, there's a big steel door that has um, a deadbolt on it. And we always kept that locked because you could also access the basement from an outside door. You didn't have to access it only from the house. So if someone managed to get in from the outside, they couldn't get up into the house. It's locked too. Both of us, you know, we sat in, uh, did you really hear that? It's like, yes, I heard that too. And it was only onto the second one that we realized that it was a male voice and was upset that when he called, she hadn't come. 
at dinner one night, it was a New Year's Eve and we had had uh, a big dinner party. There was probably four or five couples that had come and us as, as the younger kids were having dinner too. And afterwards we were having dessert and the, they were having drinks around the, the big dining room table. And um, we were telling, my mother was telling the story of this ghost that was in the house. And it turns out that my godfather's new girlfriend was a medium and she says oh I know all about ghosts I can talk to them let's do a seance well my mother didn't think a seance was very good on a New Year's Eve she said well then let's take a walk around the house so she grabbed a candle from the from the dining room table and we walked around the house and the house has a lot of old fireplaces had a lot of old furniture um, in one of the rooms there was a fireplace that had been boarded up and she was explaining how the ghosts like to hide in, in these fireplaces or ones that are boarded up, old pictures. So she went through each room, looked at everything. When she got to the parents' master bedroom, she saw the mirror standing there. And it's uh, quite an old mirror on a stand that swivels, that can swivel back and forth. And she walked right over to it and put her hand on the mirror and it started shaking and the flame of the candle went about three inches tall and didn't flicker. So my sister was scared at that point. <laughs> I thought it was more interesting in like, how did she make the candle do that? <laughs> and she said, nope, the ghost is in here. The ghost is in the mirror. And she closed her eyes and she went into a trance and said, he, it, it's a male. He died in front of the mirror and because there was nothing else around, he went into the mirror. Where did you get the mirror? So we had bought it from an estate sale when we had first come to Almont. And my dad went to the owner of the, of the house that we had bought it from. And she, the, the woman had said, no, no, we bought that at an antique house in Toronto. So she went and did, he, or my dad went and did some research, looked it up, and uh, it turned out that that shipment of antiques had come from England. And that's when we deduced, ah, it was around this time period, we had them date the mirror, and uh, that's when we realized it wasn't uh, a bathrobe that we had thought that my mother had seen, but it was more of like a petticoat kind of thing with buttons up the front and then the, the flare. This medium, because she was a friend of the family now, she came back quite a few times and always wanted to go and talk to him. So she'd go up and, and apparently he had been sick and very, the story that I remember is that he had been very sick and, and very quickly died, like within days, gotten sick and died and so didn't really know what was happening and and, and hadn't passed to the other side. So there may be unfinished business, there may be things that he had wanted to accomplish and to do, or it could just be that he didn't realize he was dead. Now, there was another time when I saw him. I had been babysitting my sister. My parents had gone out for the evening, and my sister and I were there alone. And our bedrooms are at one end of the house, and the washroom, was upstairs at the other end of the house. So you had to walk past my parents' bedroom in order to get to the washroom. And it was, you know, late at night, past midnight. And I remember walking past my parents' room and glancing and there was a figure standing at the window. And because I had been sleeping, I just kind of walked past and thought, oh, what's dad doing up? and went to the washroom, and by the time I got to the washroom, I realized, hold it, they're not home. So again, your mind goes to the most logical solution, and it's a man standing at the window, it's my father, but because I had been sleeping, I didn't realize until I kind of got to the bathroom and, uh-oh, he's not home. Who are you? I vividly remember turning to the left and looking and seeing a figure in the moonlight reflected looking out the window. Why are you 
are you telling everyone about me? <laughs> She has told me that it's spoken to her, but I don't think she has ever seen it. So after she knew that this was, this, there, there really was a ghost in the mirror, she had uh, come home a couple of times and she had noticed that the dog would be standing and, and looking at something in the corner. And the dog was female. So she, she determined, oh no, the dog has, has seen this ghost as well and has has determined that the it's in this corner. And so the, the kind of joke of the family is everybody has seen or heard this ghost, including the dog, which was female, except my dad. The ghost never really appeared to males and always went towards the females. It's him, it's the ghost. She was young and beautiful, and she was blessed with exceptional talent. She was on the cusp of having a successful European tour as a concert pianist, playing to both the general public and the aristocracy. Ethel O'Neill was born in Hamilton, Ontario, on August 21st, 1878. Her father, John, was a successful journalist who had a wonderful way with words. Ethel's mother was an accomplished musician. Ethel would inherit both of her parents' talents. We were so blessed as children to have such wonderful parents. They gave us a joyous home life and they taught us to appreciate the arts and fine literature. Ethel was a stellar pianist and played in concerts in major American cities, including New York. In 1907, she was offered a tour in Europe and the opportunity to teach piano to members of the upper levels of European society. Robert Tate Mackenzie was born on the 8th line of Ramsey near the present-day Mill of Kintail on May 26, 1867. He would later attend Almont High School. He and fellow student James Naismith, the eventual inventor of basketball, were the closest of friends. Mackenzie would go on to receive his medical degree at McGill University in the late 1880s. Inspired by his good friend James, Tate developed an interest in physical education. In 1904, he launched a second parallel career when he accepted the position of Director of Physical Education at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. While at McGill, Mackenzie also discovered that he had a passion and a talent for art. This would lead to yet another parallel career that would result in his becoming a world-renowned sculptor. As fate would have it, in 1907, Ethel and Tate each embarked on a journey to Europe when, like a scene in a movie, they met on board ship. These two kindred souls had an immediate connection which quickly blossomed into love. As Tate put it, Ethel is the one woman who was necessary to complete my life. I often gaze at the bas-relief Tate sculpted of me. And I love the beautiful inscription to Ethel, the thousand times beloved, the dark haired, the precious, joy of my youth, pride of my life, darling of my heart, with my soul's devotion. Ethel and Tate were married on August 18, 1907 in the Chapel Royal in Dublin Castle in Ireland. The wedding was hosted by Lord and Lady Aberdeen. The Mackenzies set up their home in Philadelphia. Tate's fame as a sculptor skyrocketed. He was renowned worldwide with exhibitions throughout North America and Europe. The perfect mix of his fame, their charm, and her skill as a hostess 
propelled them into the upper echelons of society, so high, in fact, that they dined with King George V and Queen Mary. In spite of all this heady success, Tate's heart remained in his birthplace. In 1931, the Mackenzies purchased the old Baird's grist mill on the Indian River as a summer home and studio. They restored it and renamed it the Mill of Kintail. Ethel and Tate came to treasure their summers spent in this idyllic setting. There was just one tiny flaw. She really wanted to be a uh, classical pianist, right? And so back in those times, when, uh, when you were a woman and you got married, you didn't really have a lot of occupation uh, opportunities. You were, you were just kind of a wife at that point. And so I think, I think she might be a little bothered that she never was able to fully fulfill her composing goals. Given the times, Ethel had to leave her musical career behind. Oh, what could have been? The concert halls of Europe, playing for royalty. I have been asked if I resent giving up my career for Tate. And if you can believe it, I have even been asked if I resent Tate. Can you imagine? Perhaps it is fair to say that I have mourned the loss of my career, and in truth, I still mourn for it. But I could never resent Tate. I adore him. I think that Ethel may have felt that um, she lived in Mackenzie's shadow. Um, he was the one that was, you know, doctor to the governor general. He was the one that was the sculptor. Um, and maybe she thought that, you know, the poetry and things that she did uh, weren't, didn't make quite the mark that Mackenzie did in this world. Um, and I think our, our visitors that come here too tend to forget just how talented Ethel was. Um, she used to sit on an old uh, mill wheel that's just down one of the trails here, and we call that Ethel's Spot. Um, she used to sit there and, and write her poetry and just sort of contemplate life in general, I guess. My dreams for a career may not have been fulfilled, but I still find solace and joy in my poetry and my music. And what better place to do it than here, in my beloved summer home? I will never leave it. Never. They loved this place so much. Um, I just like to think that they're still here. They just may not come out till nighttime. <laughs> it is widely believed that the mill is haunted, and there are many signs that the Mackenzies are in fact still here. Most of the signs point to Ethel, but some suggest that Tate has also stayed with her. Well, I think the, the first time that I actually experienced something was I was only here maybe, I don't know, maybe six months. Um, and of course, uh, sometimes I'm here by myself, um, so things can be a little bit uh, almost lonesome here. But I had come in one day to open up the building, um, and when I came up the stairs, uh, I noticed that there was a couple of Mackenzie's walking sticks um, missing from the big urn out by the front door. So I thought, well, that's really strange. They're artifacts. We don't uh, encourage anybody to take them out. So I went on a bit of a hunt um, and found the walking sticks actually resting beside a settee that's uh, in the old kitchen here. And they were just resting there. Um, and there was actually, uh, the back of the settee was actually pulled down, which happens when people actually sit on it. Um, every night when we leave, we always sort of primp things back up and, and get everything ready and in order for the next day. Um, and here were these walking sticks. It was just like somebody had come in from a walk and sat down on the settee and left their walking sticks there. It would be easy to dismiss this occurrence as being nothing more than a prank being played by other staff members, but not so fast. 
at first I thought that somebody perhaps was playing a bit of a joke on me because I was a bit of a newbie. Um, and it ha actually happened two or three more times. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to beat them at their own game. Uh, we have an alarm system here um, in the museum. So I actually contacted the alarm company to see whose code. We all have a security code that's put into the alarm system. Um, so I actually called the security company and uh, my code was the last one put in um, and the first one put in in the morning. Um, and the time coincided for when I actually left the building for the day. Um, so I know that I was the only one that was here in the building. Oh, there's no way that anybody can access um, the building once we shut, the, shut those front doors. Uh, generally when it's closing time, the first thing we do is shut the big front doors at the front of the building. Um, then we go upstairs, we cover everything in plastic, we shut all the windows, uh, make sure that the cabinets are still locked, everything is okay. Come down to the second floor, make sure all the doors, everything is locked. Um, all walking sticks are back where they're supposed to be. The piano stool is shoved back under the piano. Um, and then proceed downstairs, do the same thing on the bottom level. Um, then we set the security system and, and out we go. We make sure all the lights are off. Um, and because with our security system, we all have individual codes uh, to get us into the building. So, and the alarm company keeps track of those codes. So you know if there's somebody else tries to get into the building, it's bizarre. You know, you make sure that everything is done, everything is off, and, and then to get a call in the middle of the night and have to come here in the dark, um, is a little bit nerve-wracking, but but you're sure and, and most of the time at least with the students There's another student with them. So if they haven't gotten something the other student has so for all these things to happen um, When there's generally a witness um, It's unexplainable When I'm closing up I'll tuck chairs in and make sure everything is nice neat and tidy and then if I if I'm the first one in in the morning uh, sometimes there'll be little things moved around a chair will be pulled out or a uh, lamp will be moved, just small things. It's, it's a little weird when it first starts happening, but this has happened, like, to me personally, like, a, a couple times, and, and it seems to happen to everyone. It's just kind of, it's a regular occurrence. You almost get used to it, which is kind of weird, but... Uh, footsteps, no. Doors closing, yeah. Yeah, uh, the one back here, specifically up to the studio, uh, here, that, that opens and closes pretty frequently. I was, uh, sitting up in the gift shop, and there were, there were one or two people in, and they were uh, up in the studio. And uh, I guess the door had closed on them, so when they were leaving, they, they asked if I had uh, locked the door on them. And I said, no, I was, I was just sitting in the gift shop. And so someone had, uh, someone had shut the door on them and locked it. But. So this door here is uh, the one that leads up to Mackenzie's studio um, upstairs. And as you can see, it's an interior door um, with a latch. And this is actually the one that will just slam shut uh, for no reason. This has happened several times. Um, it's not wonky on its hinges. Everything seems to be just fine. Uh, but for no reason, um, it, the door will just slam shut. Um, so as you can see on the door, um, there's a latch here um, and you'd actually have to physically uh, close it and pull the latch this way. Um, even if the wind did blow it, um, there's no way you'd ever get it uh, to latch like that. So that's another one of the unexplainable things that happen here. As mentioned earlier, most of the signs point to the presence of Ethel. Many of those signs center on the piano. Ethel McKenzie was a concert pianist and every day here at the mill when Ethel and, and Tate were here, um, everything would stop at, at one o'clock and they would have tea and Ethel would play the piano and Mackenzie would sculpt upstairs. But um, quite often uh, we've come in and this piano stool um, will be moved out from the piano. Now we always keep it pushed in underneath the piano because it spins and a lot of the kids that come in here like to sit on it and twirl around on it and it's quite old so we like to sort of keep it out of temptation's way. Um, a number of times, I can't even count how many times I've come in and the piano stool will be out in front of the piano on the floor and one of the kitchen chairs that are over there um, will be pulled out and to the side just like somebody is sitting there watching her playing piano.
I love when Tate listens to me play. I'll play for him tonight. Some people say it's uh, it's Ethel whenever the uh, like the piano bench gets pulled out and uh, with the door slamming. It's to me that would be like our Tate going to his uh, going to his studio or trying to keep people out of his studio if he's trying to work or something. Um, yeah, I'd say they're both they're both here doing their own thing. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's just one. Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C-sharp minor. It's my favorite piece. It's as if it were composed to bear my soul. I know this may sound immodest, but I pride myself that I play it well. Not only did she play it well, she was the first person to play this piece in concert in all of North America. The Mackenzies loved to entertain. Their guests included two Prime Ministers of Canada. Sir Robert and Lady Borden stayed at the mill several times. On one occasion, Borden had to decline. In his note, he said, it is one of my chief regrets in making this journey that I must miss the mill of Kintail, the hired man's bed, and the communion at dawn with the spirits who knew and loved the mill in its earliest days. The other prime minister who was an occasional guest at the mill was William Lyon Mackenzie King, himself no stranger to communion with the other side. It's very possible that the spirits cited by Sir Robert Borden in his note declining the Mackenzie's invitation were those of the original owners and builders of the mill, the Baird family. A co-worker um, and I were in the building. Um, it was at night. We had had a, an exhibit opening. Um, we do rotating art exhibits. And it was probably around 10 o'clock at night. and. When we close the building up, we always start upstairs and work our way down to the security system downstairs. Um, my co-worker was downstairs getting ready to uh, set the alarm. Um, I came down the stairs and when I got to the bottom of the stairs, we heard this awful continuous noise and the easiest way for me to explain it is it almost sounded like somebody was dumping a load of sand onto the floor. Um, it was very loud. Um, it went on for quite some time, long enough that my coworker said, let's just go. We just didn't even set the alarm. Uh, we just left the building. She was, she was really um, scared. Um, the following month, we had another art exhibit opening, um, and it was some First Nations uh, artwork that was being hung in the museum and being exhibited. And one of the gentlemen um, that was here had asked us if we, if there was any weird things that had happened in here because he was feeling some sort of sensing something, I guess, in the building. So we proceeded to tell him exactly what had gone on that night because it was pretty fresh in our minds at that time. And he said, well, you know, girls, if you think back about it, this used to be a grist mill. Do you think maybe it was the sound of grist uh, running through the tubes or the piping in, into the grindstone? And when I come to think of it, I, that's almost exactly what it sounded like. And I think the fact that there was two of us here that, that heard it, um, I know it sticks in her memory just as much as it does mine. Perhaps Ethel remains alone in the mill all these decades after her passing. 
or perhaps she and Tate still share their beloved summer home in their afterlives. And just maybe they are occasionally joined by one or more of the Bairds. One thing is for certain, the next time you find yourself standing in an apparently empty room in the mill of Kintail, and no one seems to be around, be aware that you may not be alone after all. <laughs>